Well, PBC are initials that have historically stood for a disease entity called primary biliary cirrhosis. However, that has been a misnomer from the origination of that term in that the majority of people with diagnosis do not have cirrhosis and with the current abilities for therapy that have been devised over the past two and a half decades, the majority who do not have cirrhosis may not pro ever progress to cirrhosis. And for that reason, an international uh, group that I've been part of has formulated the name change recommendation to primary biliary cholangitis. Now cholangitis actually captures what's going on in everyone's liver with this disease, which is an inflammatory lesion of bile ducts that destroy the bile ducts. So we can call it PBC still, but we really want it to be known as primary biliary cholangitis. Now what is the disease? It's an autoimmune disease, and as in all autoimmune diseases, it afflicts more women than, do it, uh, than it afflicts men. It's about 10 women for every one man. It is a disease in autoimmunity that's somewhat unique because we don't see it in childhood. We see it in adult, adulthood from young adults to older adults. And the principal pathology of the disease is an inflammation of the bile ducts, the cholangitis, that results in the destruction of the cells lining the small to medium caliber bile ducts and ultimately in their complete uh, elimination and ablation. Now what's a bile duct? A bile duct's really the plumbing system of the liver. The liver is an organ made up of different tissues, so it has vascular tissues feeding the blood supply into and out of it. It has the major liver cell called the hepatocyte, which is arrayed in, like leaves on a tree. And those branches on a tree, the vascular branches that supply the liver, are accompanied by a system that drains bile made by hepatocytes in a retrograde fashion, blood flowing in, and then it flows out. But as bile is generated, it flows out, and it flows down along with the uh, vascularity. And in fact, every bile duct is tightly aligned with a branch of the artery. Bile ducts like arterial blood supply, even their smallest branches. So when I say small caliber bile ducts, I mean the ones that are closest to where bile is generated. Just like branches of the tree, that it gets bigger and bigger and there's finally a trunk of a tree and in the bile duct, that's called the common bile duct. It lies outside the liver and links over to the first part of the uh, duodenum and allows bile to enter the duodenum where it aids in digestion and it eliminates a number of waste products that come from the liver. So it's the plumbing system that ends up being destroyed. At its little smallest twig-like branches in that tree uh, analogy. Now when that's destroyed, you get inflammation, you get a backup, just like you back up your plumbing in your house, and that backup of bile, which we call cholestasis, which is fancy Greek means, in Greek, chole means bile, stasis means stasis. So it's a cessation of bile flow in the backed up plumbing, harms the hepatocyte and causes additional inflammation, and that triggers scarring. Untreated, that scarring will advance over some period of time, usually years, sometimes even decades, but almost always, if untreated, it will cause cirrhosis of the liver. Now, therefore, a person with PBC could have cirrhosis, might even be diagnosed at that stage, but increasingly, they don't. And we diagnose them earlier because we have, in all of our testing that most people go through as adults, during a physical examination or an eva evaluation, be it uh, for a, an illness that they're visiting or an emergency room visit, they get a multiphasic panel that has the key enzyme on it that helps us diagnose this disease called alkaline phosphatase. And if that alkaline phosphatase is elevated, then it ha you have to really search for the cause. And it's in the search for the cause that we can make this diagnosis uh, early. And I mentioned before that currently, over the last two and a half decades, we've had the ability to introduce a therapy. That therapy is called ursodeoxycholic acid, or urso for short. Sometimes people call it UDCA, but urso is probably the shortest and most recognized term. 
What it is, is a bile acid. It is actually the same bile acid that's generated in the liver cells, the hepatocytes, that is pumped out into the fluid that is going down that plumbing system of the biliary tract. We as human beings make only about 1% of our bile acids as ursa, but other species make the majority of their bile as ursa. What we know is that if you take this orally, it will go down the intestinal tract, be absorbed, come back to the liver, and when it is taken on a routine daily basis, it will dilute out the other types of bile acids. And when it does that, it has a very beneficial effect because Urso has the ability to be very water soluble. And with the other bile acids, they're not very water soluble. So the Urso can displace their toxicities from the membranes of the cells and help the liver cells live longer. It also has a minor anti-inflammatory effect. It also has an effect on cells that are getting stressed enough to go through a death process and it can prevent that or delay it. So Urso has all of these effects, but the most important one is that since Urso was introduced as off-label use, it was originally FDA and worldwide approved to dissolve cholesterol gallstones, but nobody really did that. We used it in these diseases because we knew they had cholestasis. And then we fast forward after that use to an FDA approval specifically for Urso in PBC. That came in 1997. But for two and a half decades, we've really been using this. And what has happened? We've reduced the number of transplants that have performed for this disease. We've reduced the progression to cirrhosis and its complications in this disease. This we have national data on in this country. We have it from the national databases from Spain, from France, and the Netherlands, and other countries. And the reason for that is it was so easy to use. It was a natural bile acid. It was taken on a daily basis and it basically had no side effects. Very, very uh, little intolerance for patients taking it. So because it was so penetrant in its use, when we now can look and we say, all right, everybody was taking it, who ended up still needing a transplant, say, in their future? Now that was looked at at the national databases in Europe because their national health systems have that kind of clarity and long-term long follow-up. And they found right away that if you took Urso and you had a drop of your alkaline phosphatase of approximately 40%, and in addition, if you had a normalization of your bilirubin level and loss of evidence of inflammation, that suddenly Urso had changed your trajectory from that of a progressive liver disease to a life expectancy equal to an age and sex matched control person in the normal population without liver disease at all. So that subgroup existed. But what it also revealed is around 30 to 40 percent didn't fall into that subgroup. So the majority benefited and they be benefited hugely. But a minority partially benefited and they're still the ones with unmet need, which is what the goal of new therapies in the field is to address that unmet need minority population to see if we can move them over to that group that has no future risk of liver-related mortality and complications.